Hi, my name is Dan Zeilinger, and I have been a world-traveling trad jazz musician for the past 40 years. Some of my most memorable performances were on the lawn of the Edinburgh Castle, at Imperial Palace in Japan, as well as TV shows and commercials around the world. I've met many people during my career, and have spent many hours on stage on and off with these musicians talking about jazz, life, and more. Some are touring musicians, some are theme park warriors, and some are casual musicians who play on weekends with their friends. I think they all have stories worthy of a movie script. And through these interviews, I'll be sharing them with you. Hi there, this is Dan Zeilinger with Trad Jazz Today. My guest, special guest this morning, is somebody who I have been uh, Dixie adjacent to. I have been... Uh, running back and forth and running into each other in hallways and uh, admired him from uh, from an audience perspective. Uh, I don't think we've really had a chance to be on stage together, although we've been at many festivals together. And that's Mr. Clint Baker. Hi, Clint. Yeah. Hi, folks. How are you doing? Hi, Dan. Does that sound accurate to you? I would say so. I remember, I have uh, memories of uh, you playing in the Misbehaving Jazz Band many years ago. Uh, I have memories of coming to hear that band many times and, with uh, Brian. I think the lineup, I think, was when I saw the band. Now, correct me if this sounds right to you. I re- the front line was Westy, Brian, and Evan. Correct. Or George. Uh, it, it and they were and they were altered. It seemed like George and... Yeah, George Probert, man. I think George and Evan alternated, right? Yeah, that's yeah, right. It just depended on the who was available for which festival type of thing. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Brad Roth, of course, on banjo. I remember that, yes. And uh-huh. Fred Montgomery. And I remember mm-hmm. seeing you, I think maybe the first time I saw you was possibly at Pismo with your band. And, uh, and that's possible, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I came out of that slam band jazz uh, jazz club type of type of band, although Misbehaving was better than uh, quite a bit better than most. And yeah. I remember walking into your set and seeing the bands to the front line sitting down and thinking, That's right. Mm-hmm. Wow, these guys are actually trying to be old. <laughs> but I, I, really enjoy, I really enjoy the music. I mean, from my perspective, you're one of the first bands I saw that took, uh, everybody took three or four choruses on, on a solo, and I thought it was great. And you were playing, of course, tunes I had never heard of up until that point, but I was a relatively new mm-hmm. new kid. Uh, let's get to all the Yeah, no, we though. were... Well, go ahead. The, no, I, I haven't never done any these Zoom meetings. This is actually the first Zoom meeting I've ever done, so... Not a problem. I apologize for my uh, chops uh, aren't so good on the on the Zoom. So. The, the point of the show was just to sort of uh, sit, sit around like we would at a... At a uh, Musicians Lounge and just chat. I what I miss the most about not being able to perform is actually the hangout. You know. Um, yeah, I agree. Not seeing the personalities and uh, and uh, and just kind of gossiping uh, back and forth. Well, gossip maybe is the wrong word. But uh, well, sometimes it was the thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Did you hear who did what to where? Um, exactly. Many times. But what what I do? I, have you managed to see any of the previous shows I've done? I have. I've seen uh, bits and pieces of a bunch. I went and checked them out to see what they were like. So. Yeah. So all I really do is just talk uh, uh, musicians who play early styles of jazz uh, through their lives and find out how they, right. they play it and how they played it and and who yeah. they played it with. So I'm I'm kind of, I'm really curious about you and your family. Of course, I just interviewed Riley. Uh, your son, not I know you did, yeah. and what a delightful yeah. kid, man. Um, yeah, he's not he's he's not he's not a not not a bad kid. He's got a he turned out pretty good all overall. Well, he, <laughs> I'm pretty happy with him. He's well spoken, and uh, uh, mm-hmm. of course, uh, it's nice to see a son who absolutely adores their father, which is <laughs> I'm fortunate to have a son, a son who helps me out with this and and kind of has followed in a couple of my footsteps as well. Um, yeah. But I'm kind of curious where you came from. Were your parents musical? No, my uh, mom and dad are not musicians, and there wasn't really any strong music uh, tradition in our family. Um, my mom and dad, my father is very into records. He was a record collector, and he actually is the first person who exposed me to, you know, like, uh, I wouldn't say it wasn't trad jazz, but 
uh, R and early uh, African American R and B music. Sure. I heard a lot of Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, Little Richard when I was growing up because that was my dad's music, and uh, and I um, and Bill Haley and the Comets, and that's Great how I checker, yeah. All that stuff was the music I heard first in my dad's home, and this is. But I was musically aware at a very young age. I'm, and that's why my career started as early as it did, as I was musically really aware. Probably the time I was like eight or nine, is really soaking up everything I could. And my dad would play records. He had a you know high. He was kind of the, of the hi-fi generation, you know. So he had a hi-fi records, and he had favorites. And so we'd play those. I'd hear those records, and I think the thing that really got me excited about uh, what you call vernacular American music is uh, the beat. You know, you hear it in like Fat Stop, particularly like the New Orleans. I didn't even know what I was hearing, but I knew that I liked the grooves on those records, particularly those uh, Little Richard records, and I love the that whole thing. And when I was young, and and it led me to. <clears throat> be very interested in the groove at a very young age. That, that um, was a lot. My, my father also was a, uh, a stereo, I guess, for his age, it would be considered a geek. Uh, and right. uh, when I was younger, by the time I was 10 years old, he had a collection of about 2,000 albums. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that explained, uh, only, I was going to say, that explains why you have such an old musical memory. Yeah, I think so, yeah. You know, and I, 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 my eye, but the thing that's funny about where things go off the tracks uh, is uh, my, um, my idea of rebelling was not to, was not to get into rock and roll, but was to get into um, early, like swing. So I, I, I remember one of my earliest record, the first records I bought when I had money, you know, like an allowance, because that was where my money was going. This is before... I had any interest in playing because sure. I didn't think that I was, I, I had low kind of low self-esteem well, as a started, kid. And, you started clarinet at 10, right? Yeah. But I mean, we're talking about, I'm talking at this time period around eight, nine years old. Okay. And I wasn't, and I, I took the clarinet up because uh, there was no connect in my mind of playing music and listening. The two things were kind of separate activities because when I heard the musicians, I thought those people were like, you know, magicians or something like they were way high up. And I was just a little kid. And I was like, even when I started playing the clarinet at 10, I didn't have any ambitions to perform even at that point. I just like, this is, I just have to get, but music was like already a big force in my life. And so the way I rebelled was to go down the, the whole, right down the traditional older style jazz thing. The first records I bought were, uh, Count Basie. I bought a Count Basie LP. I bought a Benny Goodman, the Benny, the Benny Goodman story, and I think I bought a Firehouse Five record. I think those are the first three records that I bought with my own money, <clears throat> or I think maybe the Firehouse Five record was gifted to me. I think it was, but we had a Tower Records in the, my hometown, Mountain View, where I grew, Mountain View, California. So I would, I was, I would try to get my convince my mom and dad to take me down there and buy and so I could spend my allowance on records. And that's how, and that's how the old time jazz thing came along. Um, because the, there was no, that was not something my dad was into. However, by the time I was, um, 10 or 11, um, I, my, the other thing my dad used to do, who he's still, he's still alive and he's still very much a part of, uh, our family's life. Our whole family is very close, you know, but what he used to do is uh, he was a fan of uh, FM radio. So, you know, for people who are into the hi-fi thing, they also understand what that means. It was like he would always be looking at the FM dial for music stations. So one day it was in 1982 and I was, um, he and I got up one morning, Sunday, it was a Sunday, Saturday, probably Saturday, I can't remember Saturday or Sunday morning. And we we were we were futzing with the radio dial, and we came across the Turk Murphy San Francisco Jazz Band broadcasting on K Jazz, <clears throat> which they did. I can't. I think it was Saturday mornings. And and uh, at that point, <clears throat> I knew within one song of that radio broadcast that this that's where my the tra- that particular the traditional jazz was going to be my life. Everything about the band appealed to me to my eleven ten year old sense of sensibility. You know. 
That's great. I was going to say, uh, I'm sorry, uh, when I get ambient noise, I, I shut off my microphone just so okay. you're not hearing uh, the guy outside with a weed whacker type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> actually, I, uh, although this uh, studio set is uh, purely a background, uh, mm -hmm. I'm actually in my son's apartment. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, we do these from there. Okay, uh, I was going to just say that uh, that's really, I didn't, I wasn't, I would, uh, particularly I wasn't exposed to jazz till I got into college, so I really, mm -hmm. I'm really envious. Although my parents had a huge record collection, uh, they hit me with, up, the, up the side of the head with just about everything else. Right. And uh, now, when did you start playing multiple instruments, and, and what made you decide to do that? Well, my intent was never to be a multi-instrumentalist. It was, if you, you know, Dan, you and I both are um, uh, people who have been involved in jazz, jazz and music education all of our lives, me teaching, but also being, you know, starting off in the band and being very aware of the impact of good uh, role models and teachers. You know, in, those, in the days when I was coming up in the 80s, <clears throat> late mid late 80s well, actually mid 80s at this point <clears throat> there was no, no encouragement of being a multi-instrumentalist in fact the whole idea was that you were supposed to just play one instrument and become a, uh, uh, you know become the best you could at one I came into it <clears throat> because I had this crazy idea between seven uh, it was uh, like sometime in six, six between six and seventh grade that I was going to pick up the tuba now I had been playing, my band director had switched me, my uh, elementary school band director had switched me from clarinet to trombone unceremoniously. <laughs> he came in one day and he said, you are going to play trombone. We don't need any more clarinet players. He actually said that to me. Those words. Long arms and you're tall. That's what he said. <laughs> and he said, here's a trombone. Go learn how to play it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> sure. So. I had a kind of a rough time making the transition and wasn't particularly good. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't, a, I really wasn't much of a, even, even, a, even an elementary band standpoint, wasn't much of a musician. I was pretty bad, you know? So I had a lot of other things in my mind. I was into trains and cars and all that kind of stuff. Just like a lot of trad musicians, I, I have a unhealthy obsession with trains. Yeah. That's pretty amazing actually. Isn't it? It's pretty weird. And I'm and and like my buddy Ray Cad, where he's he's a he's been kind of my steam steam uh, locomotive mentor. So I have steam locomotives on us. But anyway, my mind was full of other stuff. So it, it, when he switched me over, I, I was kind of mediocre trombone, kind of your second chair guy. And um, I'm just surprised and I, your your mind could switch clefts. Uh, well, I well I couldn't I didn't get far enough on clarinet to ever to to really learn much. I mean, I was I started and I was kind of kind of okay at it. I was pretty I was one of the better clarinets in that that class. But but then you know then I I you know I had a lot on you know I was music was always the thing is music's always important. But th there was a disconnect between playing music and thinking, gee, I could do that. Right. That never occurred to me until a little later. So I s switched to trombone. I played trombone you know, pretty badly. And then I got to sixth grade and I had a really, really excellent junior high band director and she made all the difference. So at this point, she, the thing, my superpower when I was a kid is I didn't care about soloing. So you imagine I'm in sixth grade, I'm in the lab band, you know, the beginning jazz band and nobody wants to play a solo except for me. I'm like, I'll play a solo. And at that point, like in sixth grade, I started realizing I could be one of those guys on one of those records. You know, I could be Lou McGarity or somebody who was, you know, on the Mini Goodman band or, you know, Al Gray. And, the, you know, I, then all of a sudden I had this idea that I could do play music and I could be I could make music. And that was the first time it, it, the epiphany came. And so I took the trombone and I got to be pretty good at trombone. Sixth and seventh grade got into the main jazz band. But also, I decided I wanted to learn to play the tuba. I, I, there, I don't even remember what motivated me to do it. It might have been Bill Carroll in the Turk Murphy band because I'd been listening to so much of the, the Turk Murphy jazz band, and I'd heard so many old records. By this point, as soon as I heard Turk Murphy, <clears throat> I started collecting Jelly Roll Morton, King Oliver, all of the basics, right? Armstrong. Sure. And I started collecting all of that music in records and learning as much as I could as quickly as possible. So the, so, cause you know, in the end, I mean, 
you know, I didn't mention the fact that Louis Armstrong was is was the thing that he's my patron saint, right? I mean, like that's we have we have it's almost like we have a shrine in our living room to Louis Armstrong. And I know that my friend Leon Oakley, who played in the Murphy band, he has a little shrine to Armstrong too. And we have we have probably more pictures of Louis Armstrong Louis Armstrong in our house than anything. So, you know, and Turk actually Turk Murphy's music helped me solidify that. So I started obsessing about the music. And that's, I think, why I wanted to play the tubas. I got attracted to the bass parts, and I realized, well, the bass parts, like you know, are are the are the are the the foundation of all music. You actually have the most power in that care. Yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly. So I picked up the tuba, and you know, the great you'll you'll appreciate this as a tuba player. My greatest, you probably don't necessarily agree with my ethos, <laughs> but my greatest desire from seventh grade to high school was to get a recording bass. I wanted a forward bell tuba more than anything. <clears throat> and there were none in our world anymore. Cause I, you know, as music education had <clears throat> shifted from the 1970s and sixties where those were ubiquitous to everybody got rid of them and switched over to uh, mirror phones. You know, we yeah. were, our, our school was all mirror phones, you know. I, I've got to tell you something real quick that it's going to break your heart. When I was in high school, we yeah. actually had a Bellfront mirror phone, mm. which was... I remember those, yeah. And and uh, and I loved that horn. And after I graduated, about two years after I graduated, when I started playing jazz, I contacted mm -hmm. my old high school band director and asked if they would sell that to me. Yeah. And he says, well, in order to do that, we have to offer it to everybody else in the district first. Oh, yeah. I've heard about that before. And they um, offered it to the art department at high school, and they bought oh. it. They, they used it as a prop. That's sad, you I know. know. <laughs> I thought well, you anyway, that, I totally get that. I mean, so that, but that also dovetails with the multi-instrumentalist thing. So, so I picked up the tuba, and then then my junior high band director did one of the best jujitsu jiu moves you could ever do to a thirteen-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to start a band. I decided, but I wanted her to help me start the band. She was like, and, and she, this woman is, is named Linda Snyder. And she's one of the greatest, one of the great educators. You know, these, you know, these people. Sure. You, I think you are one of these people yourself who are fabulous. I was, I was inspired by them. I understand what you're saying. But you know what I mean? But, you know, as educators and she, so she told me, she says, well, I'll buy you the books. These are those, I lost my heart in Dixieland books, uh -huh. you know, the red and blue books, but you're going to run the band. I'm not going to run the band. It's I want you to do it. So that was greasy kid stuff. That was greasy. That was the beginning of greasy kid stuff. And so what happened is at a 1984, I'm 13. I'm transitioning seventh to eighth grade. And I start the band and my mom and dad open the living room. My mom makes the snacks, you know, the whole story. That's wonderful. And I started as the tuba player in the original a band because I couldn't find any tuba players that I, I and I knew that that was a, it instinctually understood that I needed to be to get the sound right. I mean, I had I've been I had done a you have to understand between the time and the, I know these years are tight, but you know in in, in in human development, the time in the early is years you 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 make so much progress. So we're talking about increments of like a year, maybe two or three years, but by the time I was by the time I, I was out of I started in sixth grade as you know kind of a mediocre and by the time i was graduate got out of junior high in eighth grade i was already leading a band and we were already working gigs so i've been leading a band since 1984 and um and i have proof because there's a picture of us in the eighth grade book called the, the dixie the, in the in the yearbook called dixieland band and uh, that was that was how we got started and that's how i got interested in me and multi instrumentals because i realized pretty quickly that people were going to be transient. They're going to leave the band, come in, come out. And I decided, and I also wanted to supply, I got so obsessed with this stuff that I wanted to supply the kids with instruments that were proper instruments. Like I wanted a banjo. So I went to try to get a banjo. I got an acoustic guitar and then I wanted to get a coronet because coronets were, as you know, at that point there were no coronets. Right. So I was, I got obsessed with buying those. 
When, and um, uh, mm-hmm. excuse me, from that yeah. original from that original band, were there in, are there any members of the Greasy Kid stuff that are still playing other than yourself? Not the original original band, because that was such a long time ago. But I'm in touch. I I know uh, I know a lot of those people ended up. Oh no, yeah, there's still some of them are playing, but they're not playing. They didn't play tra- jazz, right? But they all a lot of them went, a lot of them played music. In fact, uh, yeah, you're right. I'm just it's like all of this is popping back in my head i think three or four of them still play music and that's amazing considering that these were kids that i coerced right into playing this weird music uh, and in fact more than that i think yeah almost all of them still play music now i don't, wouldn't they don't play trad jazz but they're but it's but you know this is so long ago sure. and it was such a weird beginning but i had that band through junior uh, all the way through high school and in high school is when things got interesting because then I really took it up a couple of notches. And at that point I learned to play the banjo because I wanted to play the Lou Waters charts. I was able to get a hold of Lou Waters charts through Ted Schaefer. Right. He, he's had, he actually didn't have the Waters charts. He had the Charlie Sonestine arrangements. And I bought those and I realized that, that and I wasn't playing trumpet at this point. I was strictly a low brass player. And I took up the banjo uh, at the same around that same time in drums. Well, I've got to uh, ask: what, Did you take up tenor or plectrum? I took up both. I played both initially, and uh, and I played plectrum and tenor interchangeably in that early version of the band. Uh, and then I ended up switch. I didn't end up specializing tenor because everybody else played plectrum, so I wanted to just be <laughs> weird. And uh, that was, and also I was really enamored with two things. I was enamored with uh, 20s dance band records, particularly like McKinney's Cotton Pickers and those kind of hot, uh, particularly African American bands. And I, and it was tenor banjos were important part of what drove those bands. And I was also very interested in those. I started getting interested in the George Lewis band. And my favorite banjo, one of my favorite banjo players of all time was Lawrence Marrero. And he played tenor. And I actually got to the point where I could play pretty much almost, I can almost play exact, I can almost, an exact imitation of Lawrence Marrero. It's one of my secret skills that very people know about. Um, I got so obsessed with his, the way he played and bought and figured it out, you know? Cool. So band yeah, leading I, and I, then, I, yeah, sorry. I'll just say I find out a lot of multi-instrumentalists do it exactly that way. They, they pick up instruments because they bo- they booked a job and found out that they need a trombone player. They need a piano player. They need a drummer. Right. And so they just pick up the instrument themselves and, and fill the gig. And one of the things that makes me unusual is, as as to all to instrumentalists goes, I did not. I'm not a piano player, and a lot of I've noticed that most multi instruments generally are have some piano background. I have, I, I I use it as a tool, but I can't play the piano at all. Right. You know? I, I just find it so much easier to uh, picture theory on uh, having a keyboard out in front of you. Yeah, and that's what I do. But you know how I learned how to play the all the instruments was from the trombone slide because the trombone slide is a a completely uh, a visual uh, guide to what happens when you lengthen an, in, a, an instrument and short it and how all of the steps work. And that made everything from that point made sense to me, even clarinet, because you just, you're just traveling that, that distance. Sure. And for some reason that worked in my mind, you know. Well, I have to tell you, sir, I think you have a, a special mind. Uh, no, thank you. When it comes to, uh, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to uh, multiple instruments and the ability to uh, view things that are considered to be um, ethereal to most people, I, I think that you manage to find a way to visualize things, and that's a that's a special talent. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that very much. Well, I yeah, I'm go ahead. Dan. I have to admit, I'm surprised to hear your fondness for these uh, bigger bands uh, because I, you know, I've heard you mostly in combo settings or at at the most the seven piece setting. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm surprised that you haven't you weren't recruited into Don Neely's band or something at some point in time. Well, I I uh, I have to say, you know, just like a lot of us, Dan, you know, I played in every concert band, every jazz band. When I was in, when I finished high school and had a very complicated relationship with college, I started playing in the band. I started playing community. Uh, in a community college band at Foothill College in the in, in Los Altos where I grew up, I um, I started playing in that band when I was a sophomore in high school, so I got to I got to swim in the big in the deep end pretty early, 
And I, you know, my specialty in those days was bass trombone. So I worked, I was a, I, I got to the point where in high school, I had a weird, I was playing a dual, my trombone career was do, I was playing a lot of, in the main jazz band at the high school, I played second chair because that's a lot of the solos were on the second spot. And then I ended up, but a lot of everything else I was doing in the college was bass, bone and tuba. So <clears throat> I played in every I played in every ensemble from sophomore year until two or three years after, you know, in, into the college years. Every band I could play in all the time. I played. I have so much. Uh, this is something that nobody, very few people know. I have so much concert band and jazz band ensemble experience. <clears throat> One of my ways of rebelling was to to play trad jazz because in those days that, that was considered wrong or weird. And a lot of the people who were my mentors in college, I appreciated their what they gave me, but they all gave me a really bad time about playing traditional jazz. And I just kept on doing it because there is another, my other thing is I'm stubborn. <laughs> and I just, and here's the other thing, Dan, my professional career started as a junior in high school because I had taken up drums and there were no, there were, I mean, in the Bay Area in those years, you know, Steve Apple, and I were the were the only two guys who were like available for gigs. And Steve was playing with with Don, so Steve was busy all the time, pretty much all the. He was in those days. That was the go go days for Don's band. You know, in the night in the late eighties, nineties, his band was like uh, they were like on the precipice of of big stuff. You know, yeah, that's when I met and, them. Yeah, yeah, and you remember that band? I, we used to go see that band too. I was every time they were performing somewhere, I'd go see Don's band. Um, along with the Turk Murphy band and what, and, and I, and if the Count Basie band, I mean, I was, my father and mother were like, so into this whole, they were, they really supported me through all these things. So they're kind of, but also I was so busy playing when I was about 17, I started playing gigs on drums around the Bay area because there were, and I, cause I'd worked hard at playing trad jazz drums. I, I, I got obsessed with, with what did the, what, did, what what were the drummers doing on in the in the old days because it was like the question was you can't tell from this old a lot of the 78s it's really hard to tell what's going on so i found hal smith is and and recordings he was on and i worked and listened to those and jeff hamilton and those were guys who, jeff hamilton the trad jazz driver not right. jeff hamilton of and those guys were my gateways into and and steve also were my gateways into seeing visually what was going on and understanding what the equipment was supposed to be like. And so, so I, by that time I was working gigs. And then as soon as I started playing professionally, uh, this is, you'll love this one. So I was, uh, then I graduated high school and, 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 and the, the senior, my senior, senior year, I started playing the bass string bass and just farting around with it, you know? And then, um, I'm, I'm that guy. I'm the guy. You get the bass. And w- I, before I even knew what I was doing, I was playing gigs. Right. You know, I, I got a bass. I, I decided to make a go of it, got the right strings, best I could do it. And it was just, you know, flailing away. And all of a sudden, like, my phone started ringing. And I'm like, this is like I'm 19. I'm like Riley's age, you know, 18, 19, yeah. working that was cool to be have that experience early. I mean, it's that's the whole thing is I just got an early start. You know, that's the only thing that makes me special. <laughs> well, the, the thing that's neat about well, I'm going to have a lot of bass players on me about this, but the thing about the bass that's that's, that's so neat that if, if you have a good ear, if you have a good ear for intervals, it's pretty mm-hmm. natural getting around on a it is a string bass. It's not like you have to memorize you know finger combinations necessarily. Or other things, you, you can just pick your whole hand and move it to the note you need. Yeah, that's what I did, and uh, the, it's the Achilles heel. My biggest problem in, in life, in general, is that 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 I'm a low bra- I have a I'm a low brass player with a trombone player's temperament, who plays all these instruments. <clears throat> so I don't I don't have the correct personality for a lot of them. I like that I, funny. Yeah, but I don't. I don't think. In, I'm not really like. I don't have that trumpet player's personality. I'm like a total beta. You know, I'm not an alpha guy. I can play beta style. I can fake it, but it's not real. Yeah. The other problem is I taught myself how to play. The only instruments I have any legit training on are trombone and tuba. 
I had really good, I had um, good mentorship on all those instruments, but they, those instruments are, I like, I like bass bone, right? Like, so literally the day I stopped going to college, didn't finish college. I stopped. Me too. I never played the instrument again. The career path, I made my own career path in a way because there was work in the traditional jazz community and I loved the music. But, you know, my, my greatest hope is that, you know, when we were in college, they were training us to be studio musicians, right? Or whatever the, what some variation on that. And the idea is you needed to be able to read anything they handed you and play every kind of music. But the problem with that is that that was a bit of a limited career choice in the San Jose, you know, Bay Area, because what was my, what was the greatest hope? Is that some contractor would hear me and decide that I was, you know, worthy and then start hiring me for shows. Right. And to me, I could have done that. I mean, I was on the path to do it, but I didn't, but, but as traditional jazz came and pulled me more farther away from that, that the conventional world. And I never, I'm kind of, I'm dyslexic. So reading music is, I'm pretty, I'm, when I was at young, when I was at my peak in college, I was a pretty good reader, but I wasn't one of those stone cold killers, man. You know what I'm talking about? Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, guys That's, like Brian Shaw. I was on a Stone Cold Killer. I couldn't play anything that was had put in front of me the first time. When, perfectly. when I met Brian Shaw, uh, he was an awful reader, actually. He was another guy who learned, I think he faked his way through junior high pretty much and, and elementary school. He would listen to the high school march once and have it memorized. No, he was one of those guys. Yeah, but he started, good, yeah. started reading actually until his, uh, I think his senior year in high school and, and uh he and I met each other in, in uh, you'll hate this, he and I met each other in 72. No, that's, that's cool. And uh, and uh, and he actually took from Pappy Mitchell. from. Uh, oh, he did? Wow, that's cool. Yeah, which is where he got his butt kicked into reading. Oh, I imagine that would be a good way to get your butt kicked. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, but you're right. There, I mean, there are those guys. I mean, gosh, you know, Ru the Rusty Styers and... and uh, Dan Barrett on cornet and all these guys that are that well, are well it's yeah they're killers is and I'm always been kind of a rough I mean my my uh, my tastes as part of my rebellion against all things that that are normal is that I always kind of took things on to the rough side I've refined my playing a lot but when I was younger I made an effort to play rough I didn't I wasn't interested I mean I'm talking about like in high school and early part of my career Cougar Nelson, I would, uh, that 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 uh, that rough or no? I mean more like more like to back to the roots, you okay. know, like like Roy Palmer on trombone and Jim Robinson hey, and Kidori, and like on trumpet, my heroes were all. I mean, Louis, of course, is just you know, but you know, I also I've also been obsessed with King Oliver all of my life. You're probably Joe you're, Oliver's. You're probably a Jabbo Smith fan too. Oh, I love Jabbo and Jabbo, but see, that's the kind of what I'm talking about. That kind of hot, virtuoso, uh, wheels coming off style of playing really appealed to me. I couldn't, I can't, Jabbo is, you know, you, you, you think about a guy who you, you could analyze his playing. His playing has never been fully appreciated for its amazing, his, he was an amazing musician. The guy, you can't play that stuff. I mean, you've got to be like, you know, Brian Shaw level, and then you've got to practice and practice to even get the, just the actual intervals and his vocabulary as a player is crazy, you know, and that's, but that was sort of like where I was heading with like call King Oliver was, and a lot of guys, I hate these terms, like the revival, like the jazz revival to me is, is, is bunk. And I could explain, I could, we could spend a whole nother five hours <laughs> discussing this, but I don't believe in it. It because the music didn't die in New Orleans. Just the music about, kept going. I think, I think that just refers more to public perception than, than the exactly. actuality of what happened with musicians. Well, and that's like the same t thing about this this term, the term Dixieland. You know, it's like, you know, w what what we call our music. I don't call my music Dixieland. I never have. But if an agent calls you, and says, "I need a five piece Dixieland band," you know what they're talking about, and you're happy to do it, particularly if the paycheck is good. Exactly. You know, I mean, that's to me genre. The, these these terms come from the market more than they come from the music so like to me so like i use the term revival because i was into the george lewis band but i don't really think of the george lewis band as being separate from the continuum of jazz that was being played in the 20s because the music in new orleans didn't stop they it just for it, it was it was more like these cultural these things are are implied but the right. continuum of music 
and the and the and the music the world of the musician doesn't change it's the same always been the same and so like to me but i'll use the term because but i got really so a lot of people called my first band a revival style jazz band but i never looked at it that way we were just playing and i was i always incorporated you know classic jazz styles into it and also people like percy humphrey who i met see there was the advantage of getting started early i got to meet and, and play with guys like willie percy humphrey from preservation hall who were guys who were playing active in the 20s and even earlier in willie's case before 1920 right. and i got i got to context to me there's a continuum the music is it doesn't it's never stopped no it, it may morph but yeah, it morphs exactly. I talk about the fact in, in most of my interviews, in fact, that the terminologies are results of scholars wanting to categorize things, right? As opposed to what musicians musicians just trying to make a buck, right? Exactly. And and uh, the, what happens around them, and what's happening with society, and what's happening with other forms of music, influences everything the jazz guys do. And it's just right. a matter of, uh, like you said, it's a matter of the continuum over a span of time. Uh, what affects the style? Yeah, and I, my feeling about the music is I tend to want to. My aesthetic is that when I play in a band, I don't care if it's a two beat band, a swing band, or a four beat, uh, you know, revival style band, whatever the heck you call it. I just want. I here's here's my pet peeves. I'm not a big fan of amplifiers, and I'm not a big fan of electric instruments. And I have a million reasons why I don't like these things, and I could explain them because. It's got to do with how the how you feel the music. So I I want to play in an acoustic setting all the time. Now you could say that's moldy fig stuff, and that's also like you know unrealistic. And I actually I I use lots of guys who use amplifiers on guitars and basses. I, I I'm a realist, you know, particularly as a band leader. I prefer, but I prefer a certain kind of a sound. And when I have my own band, so I mean, in a way, people say, well, that's like authenticity. Like you're not, you're trying to do things like, this. yeah. There's a difference, definitely, like an authentic thing. But these are also my pet peeves. I mean, look, look, you know, like the Turk Murphy Jazz Band, six piece band could fill out this. The sound of that band could fill any hall, and they were, and they had microphones for vocals and maybe a little bit of spot micing. But it was the power of the ensemble. And see, that's another thing. And that's a lesson you learn from like, I listen, listening to Lou Waters and the King Oliver band and these, these, these traditional, larger traditional jazz band, Sam Morgan's band. These bands all had a huge sound, big, fulfilling, and they didn't, they weren't relying on speakers and amplification. Thing is, I didn't, I wasn't, inv I always, I wasn't involved in like, I never played an electric instrument. I've never played electric bass. I never listened to rock and roll. I only listened to rock and roll recently in like more what do you call modern music or pop music i didn't get into that stuff until i was in well after i was married and had kids i wasn't into that stuff so the whole era that i grew up in musically because my obsession was trad jazz and or in swing i don't have any i don't have much i didn't have much contact with the 1980s musically and i don't have any nostalgia for playing in rock bands i've never i've only played in a couple of rock i got fired from one rock band <laughs> I actually got fired from two rock bands because the way I played wasn't right. Uh, the best one is I was in high school, and these dudes I went to high school with kind of art. There's kind of art students, and they had a band, and they and I had nothing to go. In those days, I was working professionally, but I wasn't going to school, so I had a little extra time on my hands. I think I was in my early, mid mid twenties, and they started an like an art rock band, and I'd known them in high school. Said, so "Can you come and play drums?" And I say, oh, okay, sure, I'll come and play drums. And I played drums with them for a while, for a few weeks. And then they decided they fired me. My friends, these guys I knew in high school. And, and the guy the guy who led the band, he says, you know, says, you don't play the same thing every time. And this is drums. Yes. And I said, no, I don't play. I just play. I, I have a way of playing. I play the drums. He says, well, this isn't a jazz band. You have to play the same thing every time. And I was like, well, I, I think I'm going to, I think, I think we're good. I think we'll just, yeah. And and same, that was my problem. Cause I just don't have any, the whole, the whole art of rock and roll. It doesn't mean anything to me in a way. It, like I kind of vaguely understand it, but it's not, but it, I don't get it. Yeah. I actually played, I actually played Fender bass for a year with a, a surf band with a beach boy yeah. and D type band. And the thing I find out about, electric instruments is th there's absolutely no nuance it, it, it seems right 
almost impossible to gain any kind of nuance out of a out of an electrified instrument. And the, what you do get, or what they try to supply, then comes off as being uh, com- completely mechanical. So that's my problem with that. Now with amplification, my main problem with amplification at the gig is usually the engineers. No, that's now there is your problem, right? You know, I've, I mean, I've done gigs uh, where, for example, Brian Shaw had uh, set up the sound and it and it worked just fine. It sounded great to the audience. It didn't it wasn't obtrusive on stage, mm-hmm. but it depends on the engineer. Um, but like uh, I've I've been saying in a couple of my interviews that most trad festivals or most uh, uh, early jazz concert settings, the leader will just look up at the sound booth and go. Shut it yeah. down. Just shut it down. Because, or, or yeah, it's not because they don't like to be heard. It's because that the people at the switch don't know what they're doing. Well, here, here's 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 another alternate, uh, another uh, thought on this topic, is that I'm I'm a member of a well-known traditional jazz festival band, and I will remain they will remain name, name remain nameless because of their hostility towards sound people. And I joined this <laughs> band about 10, 12 years ago. And they were very hard and brutal to sound guys. And when I joined the band, I was like, we can't do this anymore. I told the guys, I said, I'm going to be the conduit to the, to the, to the sound board uh-huh. because you guys don't know what you're talking about. I actually told them this and you guys are mean and I know how to talk to these guys. So even though I have these issues with it, I've also learned B it's the, it's a bees to honey deal. Right. And I have befriended more. The guy who hates it more than anybody has befriended more soundmen on the traditional jazz circuit than most people, because I'm always kind and I'll, I'm proactive with them. Sure. And I mostly because these guys in this band were just so had such a bad reputation for yelling at sound people, and I and I and they didn't understand it because the problem is there's a divide. Because music, a lot of trad guys on the trad jazz scene, I think in jazz in general, don't really understand how do you work with a PA system, and and they don't understand the plight of the guy who's running the board. So there's always this weird stalemate. But there's a there's a bridge, and I built the yeah. bridge. Well, in, especially you know? in a jazz festival setting, you find out the majority of your sound people, quote unquote, are yeah. volunteers. Which means exactly. that even a, a gentler hand and more kindness is, is required because they're actually trying yeah. to help promote your music. No, I get that. I've always felt that way. We're we're actually pretty lucky. Just frankly, there's there is a I can think of a few guys on the West Coast here who are pretty. We have some. We're pretty blessed with some pretty good sound guys we, who are pretty responsive to things. You know. I, I kind of have a dad question for you here. Oh, of course, man. Um, when, when was the first time you became Riley's dad, as opposed to him being your son? I think it's been. I think. I think the the, the cover of the Syncopated Times probably <laughs> sealed the deal, because you know, about two months earlier, I had a long interview done by Hal, and I wasn't on the front cover, and I was a little. I was smarted a little bit from that, because Hal Hal had told me, and this is nothing against Hal. But Hal told me that I was going to be on the front cover, so it was going to be a cover story. Well, it turns out that well, I mean, really, there's nothing to see here. Why would I be on the cover? It's there's not there's nothing here. So so then two like two months later, Riley, there's Riley above the fold. It's like okay, this is it. <laughs> He's also cultivated a little bit different um, scene than I'm involved in. He's a lot more involved in the young swing scene right. than I am because I'm old, so I'm not involved in that scene. Oh, you know, and I'm not old. that old. You're, you're not old. old, my son. I'm old compared well compared to Riley and his youthfulness and his uh, expertise. Yeah, on my my music. son uh, actually is a band director um, mm-hmm. at a local high school, and which is something I did, I've uh, been adjacent to for a long time. I've I've been coaches and jazz band coaches and marching band coaches mm-hmm. for a long time. And one time we were both at a at a similar venue, and somebody asked a question just generally, and I turned around. And realized that I wasn't the person they were asking. And yeah. All of a sudden, I was Aaron's dad. In in yeah, I know. Oh, crap! You know, like the first time I saw him play in a jazz band, it was so mm-hmm. weird to be in the audience. Yeah. And and you know, it, it anyway. It's just kind of a, a dad. Well, Riley got in, did Riley tell you he got indoctrinated pretty early? You oh know? yeah, he told me about he told me about his surprise first gig and yeah, he was he was twelve. 
and uh, it was it was funny. It was a bunch of old, cranky old guys. But they all they all the thing up one Riley's one of Riley's great superpowers is that he was able to melt the hearts of so many cranky old musicians, like guys I knew who I thought, well, we're going to bring the kid on, and and these older guys who can be so caustic and rough, they all just love him. You know, yeah. well, he's a, he's a wonderful guy, and he he sat in with the. Uh, I think I even called you the day he came down and played at Curly's on that Friday. Oh, yeah. I was doing it. But uh, mm-hmm. I'm, unfortunately, we're running out of a, a little bit of time here, and I want to talk a little bit about Ramona. Oh, of course, a, yeah. A, a phenomenal uh, class, uh, ragtime piano player and, and somebody with a, a very early aesthetic herself. Yeah, well, she's a, she she's she's one of those kids. She's like a – like Riley, Riley really – Riley, Riley's got a lot of talent, but he really put his mind to doing it. But Ramona is like a special person. She's, she's an artist. She's a writer, and she's night. She's Riley and Ramona are twins, which people maybe don't know. They're and they're they're, they're they're going to turn twenty, coming up. And Ramona is uh, Ramona had so much uh, g- was so gifted in music when she was a kid. It was unbelievable. Well, it turns out that she has perfect pitch, and she doesn't read music, at all. But if she can hear play anything, pretty much anything she hears, she can play and she can play it in all 12 keys. Ooh. I've seen her do things like she'll move, like you hear a practice, she'll play this complicated ragtime passage and then she'll stop and you'll hear it a half step higher and she'll just move around and she's like, Oh, so there's something in her mind that's, that, that is beyond anything that, that I can even, I don't even know where it comes from. I certainly don't have it. And when people, so it's it's the it's that perfect it's the it's the it's a sixth sense, right? Music is a sixth sense to her, and she's and she's also a great writer, and she's already writing for the Syncopated Times. She's had a column in that paper for almost a, I think I'm over a year now, where she writes about esoteric, um, you know, ragtime and early recording industry people, and she draws every day. She is an art. She is a true artist in the sense that she is absolutely disciplined in her work. She has a every daily discipline. She gets up in the morning, she uh, draws. And then during the afternoon, she practices. She draws all day, but she starts off in the morning drawing. And then she practices piano in the afternoon, and then she writes at night. And it's an amazing, I've never, I can't believe it. I mean, I don't know where that discipline comes from. I mean, you know, I didn't model that kind of discipline. So. <laughs> she's very motivated and she's already had a lot of successes in her life. You know, she's been, she's on the board of the American, some of phonograph, the American uh, phonograph research group. I mean, she's just like, I'm not on the board, but she's a member of this group and she's got uh, lots of people in that community who she's become kind of an authority already. It's interesting um, that she obviously loves researching on top of it all. That's all. That's her, that's her life, you know? She's also gone and, 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 and contacted through ancestry uh, families of old recording artists that she's interested in, and she's had pretty good success with that. And she's also acquired – she's already re- acquired one collection of memorabilia from one of these guys' collections. She's working with another family to get more information, uh, pictures, and uh, writings to add to her articles, but she's super motivated. And she dresses – and the thing – it's the one thing that's interesting about her, she dresses – like the turn of the century, 20th century, but she does it every day. There's never, there's never any time when she's not in period clothes, even at night. Like even her nightgown is period. She just made a decision. She's basically she's a punk, but but she's like, but, but instead of becoming a punk with a nose ring and an electric bass and a garage band, she took it the other direction. But the the essential root of it's the same. It know? sounds like she's rebelling like her old man did. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, it's been a real pleasure, Clint. I, I'm. So, uh, I would like to keep you on tap for future uh, talks. Um, of course. I, I, I want to do a whole series of uh, talks based strictly around education and jazz education. Oh, I'd love to do that. Yeah. With, with a lot of of my people that I've interviewed, but this initial one was just to sort of get our personalities and and these people uh, chronicled, uh, so we don't go, we don't fade into the past. Well, I appreciate you, what you're doing. I really enjoyed the shows, and thank you for doing it. It means a lot to the whole community that you're doing this. You know. Oh golly. Oh well, thank you. The the it was my I was 
Once again, it was actually my son's idea. I think you've probably heard me say that on some other interviews. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and so a lot of us owe that to him. By the way, this coming Sunday, which won't air, this won't air, we won't air this interview until probably sometime in mid to late December. Now, you're, you're, boy, you really got a lot, you got quite a production line going on these things. I've just been trying to get as much as I can while I can do it. I understand, man. That's good thinking. So, sir, thank you very much. And uh, I will be in contact with you about uh, future talks. Absolutely, man. Anytime, anything you need, I'm, I'm, I'm more than, more than willing to uh, be part of it. Thank you, well, thank Dan. Thank you. All right, you take care. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for watching Trad Jazz today. Dan shows new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Make sure to check out the archive of past shows, and please give us a thumbs up when you subscribe to the channel. Bye.